All right, let's go ahead and get the meeting started. Um, hey, Brian, host, uh, mute everybody except for the active members that are. Okay. Members. All right, let's see. Let's uh, go ahead and get started here. The uh, to, this is uh, tonight. We're going to have uh, the uh, tonight. We're going to have a presentation on Earth, Moon, Earth uh, communications from um, uh, Denny. I'm looking for his call sign here. I don't remember it right offhand. Uh, November six, Hotel Victor. November 6, Hotel Victor. Uh, Denny, you are, you're in the Ventura Club, right? Yes, I, I live in Port Wanimi, but I'm in the Ventura Club. Okay. All right, let's see. Well, let's go ahead and get started with our normal uh, procedure here. Let me get my little flag up here and we'll say the Pledge of Allegiance. I did have uh, a request from somebody to have uh, to play Kate Smith, God Bless America. And I wasn't able to quite arrange that. So um, that's fantastic. <laughs> okay, let me make sure I've got the right. Okay, is the, is the flag in the right direction? It's flying. Is the yeah. boot, yes, boot? it is in the right direction. Okay, because yeah, depends how I've got my mirror set. But uh, all right. Let's uh, pledge allegiance. I pledge allegiance, allegiance to, the to the flag of the, the United flag. States of America and, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, let's see where I want to go now. This is, uh, that looks good. Um, okay, the, uh, why don't we try and introduce ourselves here? It's, everybody has people in a different order, so I am going to call off the people in order as I see them, and then we can introduce ourselves. Uh, I'm Brian, K6BPM. Well, well, this I suspect had a very specific reason for doing so. That's right, the house. Okay. Oh, I don't think so, much. Somebody has some noise going on. Here in the okay. Uh, Rick, do you want to introduce yourself? Um, Rick. Bravo. Okay. Mike, CBB. Yeah, Brian, this is Kilo Charlie. Mike, hello. Ken. Everybody, KA6, KEN, 7 3. Uh, John K. Yeah, John Kirch on November 6, November Romeo Oscar. Uh, let's see, Callie. Levi. This is Levi, K6 LCM on the Mesa and Santa Barbara. Dorothy. Uh, Dorothy, K6 DSO at five points. Looks Doc. Like, looks like Kelly's online. Doc. Doc, W6 Echo Whiskey at 4.9 point. 4.9 four point. John, W6 JPG. John. W6JPG down in Ventura. All right, there's Callie. What was Callie, you want to introduce yourself? Oh, he's waving. Okay. Uh, David Hackelman. Hi. Uh, okay, there we go. Here. Steven. Stephen Pope here, Whiskey Six Sierra Tango Papa in Samarkand. AI Six VX, Dave. Dave Schmidt, AI Six VX, member of both clubs and in Ventura. 
And I, is this a different John K or is there a, two of you? Okay, Larry. Larry? He's muted. I unmuted him. Yeah, uh, WA6 MD Jenks. Oh, so okay. So is John Kay and Dave Schmidt. Yeah, I, thanks. Um, all right, I think that's everybody that I can see on the screen here. You got me. Yeah, sorry, my microphone's right. not working today. It's, it's, it's bad, bad, bad. Okay, uh, Mike, go ahead. W0JFB in Monterey Pines, Santa Barbara. Okay, I think I got everybody. This thing seems to reorder on me, so I may have missed some people. Um, okay, as far as announcements, not much is going on. The, uh, as you all well know, um, we have been for the past couple of months now, opening up the station again on uh, uh, Saturday. We've been uh, doing pretty good business on a lot of the uh, uh, gear that had collected over the months and, uh, you know, odds and ends and things like that. Uh, people coming in and buying things and every weekend we're bringing in a little extra money for the station. The, uh, um, the, it's nice to see everybody They come by. We do our best to maintain good distancing in there. We can get about four or five people in there and still maintain the, the uh, uh, six foot distancing requirements and wear our masks. And uh, it's uh, the rest of uh, whoever else shows up kind of gathers outside. So it's working out because everybody, you know how the, if you're ever come down to the club station on Saturday, there's a sort of a regular group of people that always stop by and it's nice uh, to get everybody together, even if it's just for that one event every month or every week, that few hours. Um, the, uh, uh, we're not doing any testing uh, for licensing. However, on the website, if anybody asks you, if you go to the uh, uh, website and you go to the uh, um, uh, uh, exam link on the right hand side for the uh, licensing or for the uh, um, VE sessions. The uh, in the sidebar, there are uh, uh, there's a click on the link for the VE sessions and there's a online place that's now doing tests online and uh, I'm not exactly sure how they do them, but the ARRL seems to be satisfied with it and the FCC and everybody and one, two, one. They're, they're able to uh, get every, uh, uh, they're able to do, I think they did in one session or one day, they did like 60 some people and got their, gave them their license exams. So uh, it's still possible for people to get a license, uh, even if we're not uh, doing it ourselves. So uh, just remember to point them to the website. Um, let's see if there's anything else I can think of. Um, well, nothing terribly exciting yet. Uh, next month will be September. We're going to be getting close to the uh, to our own election season in September. I'll nominate a couple of people for the nominating committee to uh, come up with a slate for the November election. And I'm not exactly sure yet how we're going to do that. It looks at this point that we're probably not going to be meeting in person, at least not for the rest of this year. Um, the, uh, if uh, they come out with a vaccine or something, maybe everybody gets vaccinated. I don't know. But at this point, uh, things are not looking good. So we'll have to come up with some alternative voting, uh, vote by mail or vote online or something. And uh, one way or another, we'll get it done. Um, let's see. Anybody think of any, anybody else have any announcements or uh, any business that they'd like to bring up? I got my mind. No. <laughs> Callie, did you? I guess my audio is working now. Um, I hope anyway. Yeah, no, you sound good. Turn your screen down. A lot, okay. a, lot, a lot better than last time. Real good, Callie. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I got to get this, rid of this computer and get the better one. All right, thank you. You need a longer neck. 
<laughs> tilt, tilt your screen. <laughs> the, uh, anybody other else way. have any, anything? Other way. This? Other way. Callie, the other way. <laughs> That's okay. We're going to go into the presentation here. Um, anyway, I'd like to introduce uh, Denny. Is it pronounced Pistole or? Just Pistole. Sorry, Pistole. Size. Okay. Denny Pistole. He is going to uh, uh, give us a presentation on the, uh, on the magic of uh, Earth, Moon, Earth, uh, or small station, Earth, Moon, Earth communications. So let's get set up here. We're going to, I'm going to mute everybody except for Denny. And let me see where that is. Um, select the speak. Um, Levi, do you know where the mute, isn't there a button to mute everybody? Uh, is it at the bottom of the participants list there? Mute all? Is that one of them? I don't see the same thing you see, so. Okay, all right. Mute all and then uh, continue and then, okay. Uh, and then I am going to unmute uh, Denny. And uh, I think all you need to do, Denny, is share your screen. And I think we'll be good to go. Did it come up or? Uh, no, not yet. Okay, hang on a second here. Let's see. Share screen. There. There we go. All right. Okay, got a few slides to go through here. I'm going to be a little quick, but uh, uh, I hope everybody knows that EME is bouncing signals off the moon. Uh, I geared the presentation more for somebody interested in actually trying to get on uh, EME, uh, but it's generally, there'll be a lot of background information in here. Uh, I did, because I got so many slides, I skipped the part about you know what the history is. Uh, it actually goes back to the uh, mid 1950s. Uh, if you want, send me an email and I'll, I'll send you a couple of links to get the, the history of EME. Um, through all of this, though, um, we're all standing on the shoulders of giants. There's a lot of people that went before us and they were really good. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to share just a few things that I've picked up over the years of uh, trying to do this. Um, okay, let's see. Oh, come on. There, okay. Is there a way to kill that sidebar? Yeah, you okay. can uh, let's just slide it over. Okay, I didn't know if the people knew they could do that. Anyway, uh, to start off, a small station is a uh, um, a very basic station. Uh, the antennas are usually four wavelengths or, or less um, and less than 500 watts power. Uh, defines a small station. Uh, more than that, you're a medium station. And then the really big guys have got uh, a real number of, of antennas. Um, the reason we're using, I'm using uh, wavelengths here is that modern designed antennas, your gain is more dependent on how long the antenna is, how long the boom is, not how many elements you have. Um, and there was a lot of, um, of uh, misinformation about uh, gain of antennas in the old days. Uh, uh, ever, manufacturers were misrepresenting their antennas terribly. Um, a wavelength at uh, 144 mega, uh, dot one megahertz uh, to dot 200 megahertz where the emitters hang out is about 2.08 wavelengths or meters, I mean. And so we're talking an antenna that's six, six and nine, feet nine inches long to uh, be a uh, uh, four wavelength antenna. I mean, a one wavelength antenna and four wavelengths works out to about 27 feet. So they run some pretty big antennas in, um, in EME, but don't let that discourage you. Uh, the 
main thing that's changed over the last 20, 30 years is WSJT. Uh, it's made small stations with 100 watts or 200 watts and a couple of small antennas possible to work off the moon. You can still work CW with a small station, but it's really hard. It's not easy. And for the work sideband, uh, you need a bigger station. You need bigger antennas, more power, and very good conditions. Even the big guys cannot work sideband all the time. I uh, want to touch on WSJT first. Uh, I imagine most of you are familiar with the FD8, which is a part of the WSJT software package. But for two meter EME, you need to use JT65B, which is built on the same uh, basis as FT8. It uses a, a lot of the same mathematics, but different uh, tone spacings and stuff. So um, uh, it's, it's, it's different. Uh, FT8 cannot be decoded by JT65B and vice versa. And even in the JT65 world, there's a JC65A, which is used in um, terrestrial work, will not decode 65B or C and vice versa. So, um, you know, the, the main difference between the two is uh, FT8 uses eight symbols. That's where the eight comes from. 65 uses 65 symbols. These are eight bit symbols. Uh, it's, you have to get into software and uh, mathematics if you wanna, wanna uh, understand what the symbol thing means. Um, to get to JT65B is not straightforward if, if you're in the FT, uh, WSJT window. If you click on the mode taskbar up in the top of the WSJT window, you'll get into the WS or the JT65A mode. And it's sort of like, how do I get to B from here? And there's, it's not really clear in the manual. And so um, I provide you with a little cheat sheet here or what we call the incantation of getting into JT65B. Um, JT6, J, FT8 is four times faster than 65, but JT65 is a lot more sensitive, but it still takes like six minutes to do a 65 thing. But once you're into JT65B by clicking all those buttons, here's a couple of sheets to tell you exactly what we're doing. You click that enable VHF, UHF microwave features and suddenly there's a box that appears on the main menu that lets you get into what they call a sub mode. You click the up arrow in the sub mode and bang, you're in the 65B. But I could not find that in the manual and I looked all over the place. I had to have another ham tell me how to do that. You'll, you'll see single decode, you have to click that. And JT65A, it runs through a uh, decode for 65A and then runs for, through a decode for JT9, which are two common terrestrial modes for JT65A. Uh, and JT65B, uh, the FT9 is not gonna work off the moon. It's, uh, it takes some shortcuts, makes it faster, and it just not sensitive enough to get you off the moon. Um, uh, the decode after EME delay involves the fact that uh, the moon's 240,000 miles away. Uh, it's a half million mile round trip and the other guy has to go do the same trip to get back to you. So it's a million mile to work, uh, work somebody. Um, you know, a thousand miles working somebody in FT8, you don't have to worry about your delays, but um, a half million miles, it starts to add up. I'm gonna get up here with my notes. Uh, okay. Uh, there's also a couple other settings. Um, you have to be careful. There's uh, back in the advanced tab on the JT65 or the WSJT page, you have to go to the last page, this advanced page, and make sure that two pass decoding box is unchecked. Because I've had it stay checked when it should have unchecked. Because when you, you check the single pass decode button box on the first page, it should change this one. It doesn't always. So, uh, um, yeah, it's a good good habit to get into just to make sure that the, the second box got, got dechecked. Um, the manual for WSJT says, for 65 says, check the SH box, which is shorthand, to change and change the frequency tolerance to wide. So on the main window, which it doesn't tell you where the box is, the SD box is to the right of the black date and time box, and the frequency tolerance boxes are to the right of the gray DX grid box. Using this and looking at the, the main window on WSJT, that this becomes obvious, but I put it in here for uh, things. 
uh, the SH box in the old CW days, you send a zero, zero, or an O, O, O signal report. There's, there's, O means you got the guy. And um, when you heard his O, 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 you sent RO. He sent RR that he heard your RO. And then 73s, you have to send the 73 to say, we both got it. It was a, it's a handshake. And so they moved this thing into JT65B. And, in, and for RO, RR, and 73s, they only use two tones. Instead of a 65-bit symbol, they just use two tones. And this program is smart enough to, when it sees just two tones and not the full eight, it knows that <coughs> to use a shorthand. And you can shove more power into two tones than you can into 65 or to eight tones. So it um, improves your chances of making a contact by, uh, by using this shorthand box. The frequency tolerance box um, widens the span that the, the JT65B listens to for when it's listening for a signal. When a signal bounces off the moon, it changes frequency due to Doppler effects. The moon is actually moving with respect to the Earth. And libration, <coughs> which is a wobble of the moon. The moon's tidally locked, face, always facing the Earth, but it wobbles a little bit. It's not totally solidly locked to the Earth. Um, so you have to account, account for those things in the old days with um, when you had to turn the tuning knob constantly. To, the program is very good for uh, the WSJT program. Actually, makes it a lot easier for you. Okay, one of the things that you're going to need when you run uh, JT65B is a time synchronizing software. Um, Windows time sync can be off. It's advertised to be off by two seconds. I found it to be over four seconds off on at times if you if you don't update it very often. I used to mention four. There are several other software packages. One bug I found is my VTN VPN, the virtual private network, doesn't like how Dimension Four goes directly to a site and would block it. So I had to go into VP, the VPN and make an exception for uh, this particular program. It's not too hard. I just had to dig through the manual. Uh, the signals in JT65B or in all of the WSJT software programs have to be synced very closely. Your signal has to be synced to the guy transmitting within a second. If it's over a second, it's not going to decode and it can drive you nuts. You can actually see the display in FT8 and you can't connect to the guy. It might be your timing. Your timing might be off. So um, yeah, you got to run some kind of timing software. Okay, here's a quick little list of things you're going to need for a, a basic small station EME. The obvious things, an antenna, a method of pointing it, uh, preamps, and then you're going to need a feed line, a rig, and a power amplifier. We've already talked about the computer software and the interface to the rig to get uh, audio from the, your radio into the computer. Um, first thing we're going to talk about is a, an antenna. This is my opinion. I feel that you need at least 12 dBi that's decibels over an isotropic antenna of antenna gain to, to work it. Whether you use two antennas or one, uh, you're still gonna need a little bit of antenna gain. Um, and for those that are not familiar with D, DB, uh, you're gonna have to start to get a little bit familiar with it. A decibel stands for a 10th of a bell. In 1928, the Bell Laboratories renamed the unit miles of standard cable, that's telegraph cable, to the bell. Now a bell is a pretty large unit because we're talking hundreds of miles and stuff. Uh, the bell is actually a ratio, so it has to be referenced to something, but it can be referenced to the power you were getting or to a, an isotropic antenna, like in the last slide. Um, the two things you need to remember about a, a decibel is a change of one decibel is the smallest change that can be detected by the human ear. That's actually how they set it up with the uh, telegraph days. The second thing you need to remember, the system's logarithmic sort of like the Richter scale, a change of 3 dB is an increase of 1.995 times the starting power, so, or twice the starting power. If you get a 3 dB increase, you go from barely hearing to somebody to armchair copy. And a change of one decibel goes from not hearing somebody to being able to work it. Um, the path loss to the moon is horrendous. It's 252.1 decibels average. Um, that's a whole lot to one. Uh, if you send a kilowatt signal to the moon, you're only going to get 10 zeppel watts back. That's a, a one with a lot of zeros in front of it and a decimal point. 
So um, um, we're, you're working with a heck of a path loss. And so that's why we talk about good antennas, minimum feed line loss and everything else. Uh, back to antennas, uh, an off the shelf eight an element antenna will give you about 13 dBi, which is enough to work the moon, but it's marginal. It's, it's, it, you're gonna only work a handful of stations, get two of those antennas and you only double the power. You don't, you don't get 13 plus 13, you only get 16 dBi. So um, it sometimes sounds like cheating, but that, that's how the mathematics works. Um, I find that if you buy a longer antenna, it usually costs less than two smaller antennas. <coughs> but if you've got a small yard, you have to use what you can use. Um, again, beware of older antennas. They had inflated gain numbers, uh, can really fool, fool you. Um, but uh, with the new modern computer control, computer generated designs, uh, we've got much more reliable. The, the designs match what the real world antennas build. If you get really into it and go to something like the, the massive uh, M squared antenna, the 2M five wavelength long antenna, it's got a 16.84 dB gain, but the sucker is 33 feet long. So that's a, it's a big antenna. It's 15 foot turning radius. Um, you can also build your own antennas. Uh, you can save money building them. KF6 FHA, a, a ham in Ventura that's very big in moon bounce. He, he's uh, got several articles published. He builds 30 foot antennas using a tape measure, a hat, hacksaw and a hand drill. So you can do it, but it takes some careful work and you gotta work the tight tolerances. It takes a really good tape measure. You just can't use a, an off the shelf tape measure. You, you need to spend money on getting a good one. Uh, one of the things you have to do is you gotta point your antenna to the moon. And you know most people think rotor, but you can do it by hand. You don't need a rotor. Uh, some guys use a couple of protractors and every 10, 15 minutes, they go out and turn their antenna by hand. And as I said, it takes a whole minute for one transmission to be sent. <coughs> you can use commercial rotors, but you need to make sure that the rotor is accurate enough, that the readouts can read into one, one or two degrees. Um, and you need to make sure that the rotor turns smoothly. Uh, some of the older rotors jerk a lot. Uh, and if you've got a couple of antennas hanging off of it, it can bounce them around. Uh, you need to go out and retighten all the clamps every now and then. You can also build a home-built rotor. Uh, some amateurs use jack screws off of old TVRO dishes. It's actually quite popular. And the things can be quite accurate if you, with the leverages you can develop. So um, you don't have to buy everything. Uh, a commercial, good commercial rotor can run you 1,500 bucks. So it, they're not cheap. Um, preamps, you need the lowest noise preamp you can afford. Um, and you need one you can mount close to the antenna. That means you need a weatherproof box. Uh, a good preamp is going to have a noise figure less than of half a dB, 0.5 dB. Uh, they're getting lower and lower every year. Uh, the technology has really changed. Uh, some preamps come with relays inside of them. Be careful. Some of those preamps will not handle a full kW. Uh, they're made for a couple hundred watts. So be careful. I recommend getting a preamp with end connectors. End connectors are more weatherproof. Uh, they're lower loss. PL259s actually have enough loss to start impacting you uh, when you're trying to do low signal work like EME or terrestrial weak signal. <coughs> Make sure that you can dismount the preamp from the antenna or close to the antenna easily because you're going to suspect it's been blown. Um, it's one of the first things you worry about is did I accidentally pop it or did the static crash do it? And think about getting a spare. Um, they're expensive, but you know if you're in the middle of a contest or in the middle of making a cue, so being able to go out and slap a new preamp on there can uh, really save a contact. Okay, TR switches. Uh, make sure the switch you get, uh, the relay, TR relay, is uh, rated for the power and frequency you're gonna use. Uh, make sure it's weatherproof. Uh, you're gonna mount it out at the antenna. Uh, you, Try and get a one that's 12 volt rated. There's a lot of old uh, Transco relays running around. They're 28 volts. They are very good relays. They're military grade relays, but most um, sequencer boards are rated for 12 volts. You can build a, um, a, relay, a 12 volt relay operating the 28 volts, but that adds a little delay. So um, try and get a 12 volt relay if you can. 
But uh, if you can't, you know, transcos are perfectly okay to use. Uh, I recommend in connectors again. Uh, SMAs are not going to handle a kilowatt, even 100 watts is pushing an SMA. Uh, B, B and Cs aren't going to handle much over a couple hundred watts. Um, so I stick with it with end connectors. Uh, once you get used to putting them on, stick with the same brand of end connectors. <coughs> Final warning is preamps are expensive. You're going to spend some money. Use a sequ sequencer because uh, some preamps do have sacrificial resistors. Uh, the M squared preamp I've got does have, uh, but uh, the power amp doesn't like transmitting into an open load. So uh, think about a sequencer. Uh, sequencers are commercially available, or you can build your own. They're not terribly complicated circuits. Um, and it's a, some sequencers are set up to activate the relay. The relays normally does not activate the preamp. And when you put power to the a TR switch, it activates the relay so that if you lose the power to the relay, it defaults and kicks the preamp out of the circuit. Um, it's a little bit backwards from what you would think, but you have to power up the relay to listen. Uh, but it sure saves a preamp if you if you lose power or a connection comes loose or something. Feed line. Um, basic rule is go for the shortest run you can and use the best cable you can afford. Um, LMR 400 is what I would say is the minimum. Uh, RG8 214, guys use it, it's okay, but um, when you're going for a signal that you may not be able to hear or even see on the WSJT display, um, every little bit helps. Some guys run LDF 450 or LDF 550, uh, it's Heliax, it's used a lot in commercial repeater sites. It's stiff, it does not flex, you have to run flexible jumpers with it. The connectors are a little expensive. <coughs> But it is, it is good stuff if you're running. Uh, I know guys that are running LDF7, which is a inch and a quarter uh, Heliax. So um, if you're running a long run, which uh, like 100 foot, uh, you might even consider that. Uh, some people pick up LDF450 very cheap because uh, it gets um, cycled out of use. Um, so it's something to think about. Uh, the, uh, come on, whoops, wrong button. OK, rig. You need a sideband rig. Uh, CAT capability computer uh, activated transmit. I don't know. Um, capability is useful, not necessary. Uh, if you're getting a new rig, look for a computer cap capability where the rig plugs directly into your computer so you don't need an interface box. Um, JTX, uh, J WSJT uses the audio out of your rig. It doesn't use the IF. You need a 2.4 KC bandwidth. So don't set any filters when you're using WSJT. Uh, keep the bandwidth as wide as it normally is, and it'll work for, uh, and that goes for JT65B and uh, uh, FT8. RF power amplifiers, I'm, uh, guys do use 100 watt amps, but I say 200 watts is better. You're going to, you're going to get a handful of stations with 200 watts. You can find them used. Uh, I stress, put your money into antennas first, and then the feed line. Um, uh, antennas are noise free gain. Uh, they don't add noise to your system. That's the best type of gain you can get is uh, antennas. Uh, then go for the feed lines and then connectors. Um, remember, every dB that you say a loss you get rid of means you can hear somebody. It goes from a person not being able to hear them to you hearing the person and working them. So, um, and these guys, and moon bouncers go eight for getting rid of like PL 259s moving the uh, the amplifier till it sets out underneath the uh, uh, antenna. Uh, they, they go to extreme links. Okay, an interface to your rig. Uh, this is not a cat control interface. This is an interface to get the audio from your rig into your computer. I use a rig blaster. Uh, some use a signal link. Um, as I said, many new radios come with built-in interfaces. A 7300, I think, comes with one. Uh, and you can build an audio interface. Uh, you need a, couple, a 600 ohm to 600 ohm transformer couple of resistors and you can build your own audio interface. So it, it's not uh, that uh, difficult. And if you're watching this, you probably got a good enough computer to run the WSJT software. Uh, it's not hard on this on the computer at all. Uh, very modest computers can run uh, FT8, JT65B, JT65A. So don't sweat the computer too much. <coughs> now, 
if you don't, if you can't afford the rotors or you've got a very good terrestrial station up right now, there are several stations that uh, work uh, EME without being able to elevate their antennas. Uh, their antennas point at the moon at moonrise and, mo and moonset. Uh, in fact, having an antenna high off the ground can actually be a detriment. Uh, weak signal stations usually have the, a mass mounted preamp already. Um, you only get a half an hour to an hour at moonrise and moonset. But uh, I actually saw um, KK6 uh, FHJ work a guy in e England on moonrise at his location. And uh, it was uh, pretty good. Um, you get about 6 dB of gain at moonrise and moonset. That's ground gain. And that's even if you've got an elevate array that can elevate an elevation. If you point at the horizon, you get an extra 6 dB. And that uh, can be a magic time of a really hurried working to, to get a, a station while the moon's coming up off the horizon. Uh, higher antennas pick up noise from around the city, your neighbors, uh, cell or cell arrays tend to be noisy. Uh, the little inverters on those arrays, uh, the solar cell arrays are hash makers. So uh, sometimes putting the antenna down low uh, where the house shields it from the neighbors in the city uh, can actually be a, an enhancement. So uh, don't think you have to have an, a tower, a hundred foot tower to work in me. You don't. A lot, in fact, a lot of the bigger arrays are, the, the bottom of the antenna barely clears the ground. Uh, when is the best time to work off the moon? I use a uh, website, MM0 or MMONVHF. He generates charts and uh, the yellow line on that chart is the best time to work the moon. It's the lowest degradation. It takes into account noise sources in the sky, such as the galactic center, um, all sorts of things that you don't have to worry about. He does the, the hard work of figuring out when's the best time to work the moon. That doesn't mean you have to work the moon at the lowest deg degradation, but if you've got a small station, it helps. It helps a lot. Uh, the EA6VQ website, uh, you can print out a sheet that gives you the moon position all day long. So if you're, you're trying to do planning for like a week in advance, you can figure out when the moon's going to be up and all sorts of things. Another good time to work uh, EME contacts, contests, that's when a lot of guys are on. It always helps to have people on when you want to work them. Um, and if you're just starting out, uh, consider making a schedule. Uh, these are, here are two chats uh, that guys get on and you can chat with a guy, arrange a schedule. And as you're trying to work the station, you can chat back and forth and say, I'm transmitting, do you hear me? And the guy can come back and says yes or no and stuff. So um, ch chats are, uh, are really helpful. And uh, if you're just listening, you can get on the, you can listen, look at the chat page and see who's transmitting what frequencies they're transmitting on and try and see if you can hear that station on your station to see if you're um, good enough to, to work somebody. Uh, where's the moon? Um, it sounds silly because all you need to do is go outside and look and you can see the thing, it's bright, but <laughs> it's not that easy. Um, you can work the moon through clouds. There are guys in Europe that constantly work during the rain. Uh, I mean, the, the English stations have a lot of rain. They, they work the EME during rainstorms. Um, so don't let a few clouds or smoke uh, slow you down. Um, the, the moon has to be above your horizon. It's sort of budging it. You can actually work the moon a little bit below the horizon, but not much. So uh, you can get a little bit of ground. There's some effects that the atmosphere curves your, your radio waves. Uh, it's not easy to figure out, but you, you can actually work the moon just a hair below the horizon. Uh, the moon actually moves backwards across the, the stars in the background uh, in its own orbit. It not only moves with the stars, but it moves backwards across the stars. Um, so it's a, it's or, it has its own orbit around the Earth and the orbit is counterclockwise, which is backwards from uh, the way the Earth turns. Uh, the moon is also not in the elliptic. What that means is not in the plane of the Earth-Sun uh, orbit, which means we don't have an eclipse every month. If, it, if the moon was in the same plane as the Earth-Sun orbit, we'd have an eclipse every month. So uh, we don't, so, but it, uh, the, this, uh, the, the orbit of the moon processes and it's, um, and, the or, and the moon slows down. It, uh, in its uh, perigee, it's moving slower than in its apogee of its orbit. The orbit's 
fairly circular, but not totally circular. Thankfully, there are programs that calculate the moon position. There's one inside WSJTX. Uh, it's a, to enable that tracking portion, which you don't need an FT8, uh, you go up to the uh, tab at the top of the JTX uh, window. Um, you click it, and then you click ast ast astronomical data, and it drops down a bar, and you, uh, you click, um, I forget which tab, dang it. I use it all the time. Anyway, also the moon, the moon position sites, you can uh, get moon position data from, but uh, there's a little bit of slop in those uh, sites. So um, just, to, just to warn you, if you need more information on this, uh, give me a, an email and I'll walk you through it. Uh, if you wanna do the math, you can calculate your station's capability, you add up all the losses, uh, all your gain of your antennas, run it through this calculator at the site on the, put up by VK3UM, and he'll give you uh, the, the weakest signal you can, or the weakest si station you can work, you know, give you an estimate of how much gain that other station has to be before you can work them. Okay, now we get to the fun part. Um, here is a small station, uh, G0MN in uh, England. Uh, as you can see, he's got a very small antenna set up. I like the underslung antennas. Uh, they, most people put them above, but that's a balance problem. Um, he's using a commercial rotor. It's actually just a cheapy TV, elevate, TV, TV rotor turned on its side, uh, but it works for him. His antennas have got a fairly wide beam width, so he can do it. Um, he's using a, a protractor for the elevation indicator. Okay, here's his amplifier. It's sitting on the grass underneath the antenna. Uh, again, he's trying to keep his feed line short. He's using in connectors. Um, I'd get it closer to the antenna. I'd put it up on the mask for the, uh, for the antenna because uh, you'd think a foot would make a difference. It does, um, it does. So uh, this, is a, this is things he's using. If you look at the uh, um, previous thing, let's see if I can go up. If you look at this thing, he's using the bottom from an old antenna stand or an umbrella stand to hold his uh, antennas up there. So um, you can get creative. Okay, this is PV, PY7RP. Uh, he has a single antenna. He's using a TVRO uh, actuator to elevate his antenna. He's got a little bearing. Bearing is actually here that the antenna rotates on for elevation. And he's got a regular old TV rotor. This looks like a ham M possibly uh, down here. So uh, he built a homemade inclinometer that he can see with a pair of binoculars. There's a fishing weight here hung by a piece of string on this little thumbtack here, and he's marked out degrees on his uh, indicator. So you can get creative. It doesn't have to be store-bought and fancy. If it works, it works, and nobody's gonna see it unless you send them a picture. Uh, he's running a fairly big antenna. Uh, I prefer single antennas. You don't have the loss of the coupling or the uh, phasing lines, um, and you'll just have one antenna to worry about. Uh, this, is an, uh, this is him standing next to his antenna. You can see that's a fairly long antenna. That's a, probably a 30-foot antenna. Um, you got good copy on W5UN, which is kind of cheating, but I'll show you that in a minute. Uh, you can go higher in frequency. This is a 1296 operation at the North Pole. <coughs> um, there, here are the URLs for every where I've got these pictures. You're welcome to go look at their uh, presentations. Um, it does have to ha help to have a little bit of snow to stick your antenna in to save uh, from having to have uh, rotors and stuff. Um, and with 1296, that's um, 10 times the frequency of 144 megahertz. Um, that means the uh, this antenna has got lots of wavelengths of the 1296 antenna. This is uh, a very famous guy that works all over the, the world. He, he took a, a ferry over to, from Spain to Morocco and uh, carried everything on a backpack. This antenna is, uh, I think, and I got it now. Let me get my notes here. Give me just a second, catch up with my notes. Okay. 
Okay, he's a re running a five meter boom. That's equivalent to a 144 megahertz antenna with a 44 meter boom or 143 feet long. So uh, he, as you notice, is saying he's not running a preamp, but he's got a long antenna for his, for his frequency. So yes, if you have a 143 foot boom, you probably don't need a pre preamp on a two meter EME array. Uh, I don't see a whole a lot of people putting that in that take a heck of a big backyard. Um, he runs the antenna directly out of a pre transverter. He's got no antenna switching relays. He's got no preamps and only about three meters of coax. So he keeps his losses down, but it means he can call it in the backpack. It's simple, kind of foolproof, and uh, it works. He makes, uh, he's uh, calm, but he's up on 1296, which means your wavelength, your antenna elements are really short and your boom length can be uh, long and uh, take advantage of it. Now this is W5UN. Um, as the guy said, you know, I made his first contact on W5UN. This guy's got 32 antennas. There's 17 element Yagi's. Each antenna is 34 feet long. That thing is huge. This little thing here is the frame with the wheels of an old pickup truck run by an electric motor. Um, if you got the backyard for it, go ahead. <coughs> These guys here though, make small stations worth it because they can work you. Even if you've got problems with your station, these guys have got the gain to make up for your losses or your experimentation and whatever. So uh, I've met W5UN, he's a nice guy. Um, there are some other big stations. Now, here's another homemade inclinometer. It's just a protractor with a weight hanging off of it, a little bar metal, and you do it by eyeball and you set the thing by hand. Uh, it's doable. Don't let it slow you down. Here's another azimuth indicator. Nothing more than a Boy Scout compass, uh, but uh, it works. You do have to compensate for true north versus uh, magnetic north on uh, the uh, indication, but uh, there's websites for that. And here's uh, what I thought was just a very nice, clean driveway set up for a, a single antenna. Again, he's using a rotor out of a TV rotor that's got a through, this, through the rotor thing and a single antenna. So I rushed through this, uh, but we're now open for questions. Hey, Denny, in the other, the last time you uh, gave this presentation, people were asking, uh, how do you point it? And you showed, you know, many examples here using the computer, but you mentioned stuff about like background noise and center of the galaxy noise and sun noise. Can you review that, please? Uh, okay. Hang on. Uh, let's see. Well, one of the things is that V or the MMON VHF site, um, this site right here, um, he does the hard work for you. You don't have to keep track of where the uh, center of the galaxy is compared to where the, is it behind the moon or not? This guy plots it out for you, saves you the effort, but there are more than just the, uh, the black hole at the center of the galaxy that emits radio noise. Uh, there are several other <coughs> hot spots in the in the galaxy in the Milky Way that emit uh, quite a bit of noise. Um, gr the ground is actually thermally hot. It's not at zero degrees Kelvin. So it, the ground actually emits noise and you can pick it up off the back of your antenna. Uh, there's not a whole lot you can do. Some antennas claim to be less noise susceptible on the back than others. A good front to back ratio helps. Um, I don't know if I'm answering your question though, Dave. I, th I just found it was interesting where you said, uh, you know, you could just point it at the sun and the background noise goes up and point it in the, you know, off. Yes, the uh, that is a test of if you've got a, a good enough station. Um, um, you can point it, you can actually get moon noise, which is not as strong as the sun noise. It's actually reflected sun noise. So it's less noise, but yes, the sun emits enough noise that if you have a medium sized station, that's four antennas, four long antennas, uh, you should be able to pick up moon noise. I'm not quite there yet. I'm working on it. I've just got to save up my pennies to get better antennas, more of them. <coughs> Any other questions? The, um, the okay, go ahead. I guess you should go, Callie. 
Uh, I was going to say about the the rotors. One of the things, because uh, Ken N six KTH has a uh, uh, azimuth L's, and uh, I've noticed that the thing is often quite jerky. Um, any good ideas on how to how to smooth out uh, the action of uh, a jerky rotor? Just okay for elevation. I run a TBRO actuator, one of those linear actuator things. You can get them on Amazon. Yep. Uh, that's fairly smooth. Yes, I agree that the uh, the azimuth rotor I'm using, I'm using a fairly expensive one, um, and it's jerky. And I see my antennas bouncing around. I'm going, I better check and make sure the bolts are tight again. Um, uh, you can make your own rotor, your azimuth own rotor, uh, and make it smooth by uh, gear reductions and stuff. Um, but um, unless you buy a really special rotor, which I'm talking 3,000 bucks for a rotor, uh, they're going to be jerky if you're using like a a ham M or a tail twister. Um, now unfortunately, those are 1950 designs for TV antennas, which are fairly light. And uh, they're nothing more than AR-22 beefed up. So there was not a very good smooth rotor to begin with. So I, I don't know what to re recommend. Uh, you know, guys do deal with the, uh, the bouncing around. I just warn you, you know, every now and then go out and check and make sure you get, everything's tight because it, it's bouncing around a lot, I agree. So uh, I don't know what to recommend for the azimuth uh, except going to a uh, Arduino and a stepping motor <coughs> and a gearbox. Um, what, what was your feeling on like double shielded coaxes versus, you know, local, like you say, are you running on Arduinos and other things? Lo local local uh, EMI noises. Is a double um, shielded LMR um, 600 or 300 or, or what is it, 400 uh, is a double shielded coax. Um, the LDF 450 is a solid copper pipe, corrugated pipe on the outside. Uh, you don't need double shielding with LMR. Um, I don't have that much problems. I use an awful lot of ferrites and stuff on the shield. Uh, I use ferrites, you know, as a ballon up on the antenna and ferrites as the uh, coax is coming into the shack to keep the noise, you know, keep uh, RF on the outside of the coax from coming into the shack. Um, um, I recommend L uh, the LMR coax. Uh, it's easy to work with. Uh, the, like I said, the LDF 450 is a, uh, the connect connectors are expensive and it's not flexible at all. Even Superflex is not made to flex all the time. So, uh, um, LMR is a, a great compromise. And actually some of us run very short runs of coax. Uh, we actually use an SDR receiver at the antenna and run a hundred foot of uh, uh, um, um, USB cable, which is no loss. I mean, the, the digital doesn't lose anything. You, re, you reconstruct it. Any other questions? Sort of the follow up on Callie's question, um, years ago, I designed a um, declination and, and ascension system for um, tracking stars for long, doing long exposures uh, for a company in town called Santa Barbara Instrument Group. Are there people perhaps that are selling software to allow you to track the moon all night long or is it really not necessary i mean are you i mean if you have to go out there and it sounds like every 15 minutes you kind of have to tweak things it, it, is there software that'll just run both of those motors for you over the evening or yes there there are motors there are there are programs of uh, the yesu motor the yesu rotors are kind of popular for moon bounce they have a both a horse an azimuth and a elevation type rotor that you can mount right on top of each other they have interface boxes you can buy to interface the rotors to a computer, and then they have software you can buy. Now, my setup is I'm, I'm running rotors. I can control the rotors from in the, in the shack here, and I have readouts that are close enough that I don't need to go out and, and do that. I can do it from the shack with rotors. Um, but if you, if you don't want to spend, a th I mean, you can spend more for your rotors and your, your rig easily. You can spend more, more on the antennas than your rig easily. Um, so if you want to get on and you don't have a wad of cash, uh, you don't be limited by the fact I can't, you know, I can't afford the rotors because you can do it by hand. Uh, okay. don't be limited because you can't afford the antennas. You can build your own antennas. 
guys are using fiberglass flagpoles and drilling them to make antennas. They're about 30 foot long and you use uh, 3 16 a quarter inch aluminum rod and you can build your own antenna, a fairly decent antenna. So don't let the cost kill you. It's just gonna take more time and a lot of work. Thank you. So you can buy interface boards, you can hook your rotors to the computer and you can buy programs to have the uh, rotors automatically track the moon. Just be sure to turn them off before the moon goes below the horizon or try to drive your antennas in the ground. Okay, thank you. No problem. And I'm, if you got questions after this, just email me. Hey, Denny, I got a question from some people on YouTube. Go ahead, Dave. Yeah, somebody uh, is asking, they, they remember a guy in Ojai that was going to try and bounce a signal off of Jupiter with a really high-powered short pulse. Did you hear about that? And do you know what the outcome of that was? No, I don't. Uh, that's pushing it. Uh, he'd need a big antenna. He may have worked for one of the astro radio astronomy groups. Uh, that probably did. Something in the back of my mind says he, he was working with one of the big, big dishes. And uh, like El Guancan is a 150 foot dish. That's half a football field. And uh, you, got, you got a lot of gain with a dish that big. So, um, I mean, so um, I, I'm not familiar with that or the outcome of that. I could possibly look it up. Thank you. Any How other questions you... off the, the YouTube? That's the only one that I heard over on the two meter band. Denny, how many people are doing single sideband voice versus CW versus JT65? And are there other modes that people are using as well, or is it mostly just those three? Okay, that's, that's a complicated question. <laughs> Generally, right now, there are still a few holdouts that only do CW, okay? Um, JT, JT65B is being, um, Joe Taylor, who did the WSJT software, with the help of a couple of friends, has come up with a new replacement for JT65B. I haven't used it. I know it's only come out fairly recently within the last couple of years. Um, I'm just trying to get my basic station going. Um, thank you, Brian. Um, so, um, but generally everybody's on JT65B right now. Um, if you get a strong signal, some of them go over to CW. If you get a horrendous signal, you go to SSB, but SSB is really iffy. It takes a lot more gain, a lot better conditions to work SSB. People don't normally run SSB. Uh, I mean, you're talking stations like um, UN, W5UN and that uh, guy in um, Idaho, what's this called, W8? He's got, a, he's got like um, 20 antennas. So, um, and they're, they're running full legal limit and all the rest of the stuff. Um, Sideband is sort of a luxury. It's a real feather in your cap when you do it. Some guys on a small station have lucked out and worked big stations on SSB. It's not impossible, but it's not common and it's a lot of work. Huh. You have, to have all your ducks in a row and everything working just right. Okay. But it's a, it's a goal, you can, you can shoot for it. And how about um, 1296 versus What's the bottom end of the scale that people are, are using one, uh, two meters? And oh, okay. I geared just to two meters because it's a, it's, there's more people on it. Mm -hmm. um, more people have the gear that could get them the first step to going to, you know, a, a 200 watt amp is fairly common. It's not that uncommon and stuff. So it's more doable, I thought. Uh, 432 is actually, um, again, you got a, the wavelength is a third of two meters. So you get, for the same length of boom, you get three times the gain. Uh, 432 is, com is more common. 1296 is a little uh, rarer because there's not as many people on 1296. They don't make 1296 rigs like they used to. So, you know, you have to run a transverter or something. Uh, but you look at it, the antenna is tiny compared to some of the, the two meter antennas. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and it, it's portable and you can work it. Uh, there are guys like Al Ward that's working 10 gigahertz. You get much above 1296, and even on 1296, they start using dishes. And so Al Ward uses like a three-foot dish, setting a parking lot at Central States Convention, radio convention, uh, working 10 gigs off the moon. <laughs> so uh, he used WSJT, 
uh, I think it was using JT65C for some reason, because it works better on, on 10 gigs. Your frequency dispersion and stuff, your Doppler on 10 gigs is wild. So the, the signal will be way off of where you oh, think it is. Good. But uh, no, they're, they're, they're actually trying to work 24 gigahertz moon bounce right now. Wow. So well, you mentioned uh, uh, dishes, and I hadn't even thought about that. I've got an old eight foot, you know, bud or big ugly dish out in the backyard with a complete rotor on it and everything for the old satellite TV. Are there people using eight foot dishes? And if so, what, what frequencies are they typically using? You could use an eight foot dish at 1296. It starts to get a little narrow. You have to keep updating it more often because your beam width is so, so narrow. For 10 gigahertz, an eight foot dish is Ill overkill. You're only illuminating part of the moon with an eight foot dish. Uh, you're being with because of the the, the antenna game mm -hmm. uh the antenna i showed you of the guy in morocco uh his antenna is equal to about a 3.4 uh one meter 1.4 meter dish with about a four foot dish so you, you got but carrying a four foot dish on a ferry in a backpack is not exactly doable so he he has everything he folds up in a backpack and hauls it up he hauls it all over the world he's worked from easter island he worked from other places we need okay. a very small portable rig. Cool. Hey, Danny. Yes, sir. Who's that? <laughs> Go ahead. Um, unmuted. No, you, you, go ahead, Doc. Yeah, I can hear you. Oh. Were you familiar with Steve Meath in the 1980s over in the San Inez Valley? No, I wasn't. Okay, he had an 18 foot dish and a kilowatt on 1296 and 2300. And he could pick up his microphone and go, hello. And three seconds later, you'd hear your echo come back. And it was pretty amazing. He was really quite something, but he it was quite the station. We actually watched uh, video from the moon when they were on the moon because their downlink from the uh, their little go kart they ran around on the moon it was just outside the amateur band and we could pick it up and we could watch a video from the moon with it but he was a phenomenal guy he passed away a few years ago up in the San in the Bay Area but he used to be in San Ynez with an absolute tremendous station it was impressive. Yeah, but he was running an uh, an eighteen foot dish. Yes, eighteen. As I was saying, side band is workable, but you have huh? to have a tremendous amount of gain. Yeah, and you figure that you know at twelve twelve ninety six, that's like ten times, or it's not quite ten. It's a little less. It's about nine times the the wavelength of. So he's got gobs and gobs of gain. Oh gosh, it was it was amazing what he could do with the thing. Uh, in the old days, you had an IBM printout of the position of the moon. So he'd crank in azimuth and elevation and go, hello. And there it was. He could talk to anybody in the world on those frequencies. It was quite something. It was really impressive. He was probably running one of those old amps that used like six 2C39s, water cooled. I don't know what he I don't know what he used for his amplifiers, but it was a lot of military surplus uh, stuff. The uh, uh, his <laughs> microwave dish was on a military pedestal the, on a tower over there. And it was, it was quite something, but uh, really impressive. But of course, this day and age, our noise figures are a whole lot, lot lower. But he was really good at electronics design and, and came up with some really good low noise uh, preamps in those, in those days. It was, he was a pretty good guy. Still, Go antenna ahead. gain is the best gain you can have. Yeah. A bigger dish or bigger antenna is that it's low is no there's no noise in an antenna. That's right. 18 foot dish, that really helps. <laughs> Anybody Danny, else got any other questions? Yeah, I have a question. Um, do you know anything um, or have you heard anything about the new project from the ARIS program where they're looking at putting a um uh a space station with amateur radio capability in lunar orbit. I know some of the early plans show that they would be using S band, like the 1290 band, um, ham band. And uh, so people who are into EME might have an opportunity to actually work uh, stations through the relay of the, uh, 
of the satellite or the, the space station in, in lunar orbit? Well, as um, I guess as Mr. Crow uh, was mentioning, 2200 um, is half the wavelength of 1296. So you get a amplification. So a very, an eight foot dish suddenly has a lot of gain at, at you know, the, the Wi-Fi frequencies. Um, and you could probably pick, a, pick up that signal from the moon because again, you need, your antennas are smaller. They have the same gain uh, as you go up in frequency because of the wavelength is shorter. And uh, you, you can get a lot of gain out of an eight foot dish at uh, 2300, 2304. So it, it might be, you might not need to be an EME or exactly to, to listen to those signals. Mm. I was just floored by the, um, <laughs> the number of zeros that go before your uh, power level when you take into account the path loss for. Well, I got that from another you... site. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm not a math genius, but uh, yeah, it, it is a really low bit of, no the, the moon is an irregular surface. There are mountains and stuff and that scatters your, your signal. Mm -hmm. It's not a mirror. It's not, you're right. not bouncing, you're bouncing off a sphere, which scatters, and then you're bouncing off craters and all sorts of things, which scatters the signal even more. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, the path loss alone is only like 152 dB one way. Then there's the reflection, which you lose a lot of power, and that's 153 dB back. So it's, it's um, you know, it, or no, it's a round trip is 153 dB. It's Just a very path. lousy the reflector. The reflection of the, off the moon is lossy, very, very lossy. Sure. And, uh, I leave it to people like Joe Taylor, which has got, you know, as an astronomer and a mathematician, he can do all that type of figuring out the, the all those zeros. Any other questions? Well, I'm trying to, I am trying to say though, if you look at the guy in England, you can do this if you want to do it. It's going to take a bit of equipment and some time, but you can do it and you don't have to buy everything. You can build some of it. <clears throat> We may have some of that stuff down at the club station, in fact. Right. I think we got a couple of rotors. Uh, we have a couple of controllers, but I don't know. Those are for old television. Well, what I was trying to say, though, is you don't even need a rotor. You can, you can get by with just moving it by hand. I've seen guys move their antenna by hand and just you know, tie it off with a rope. You do a gun sight. You just set it up and look. You can. Right. Yeah. Some guys use TV uh, CCTVs, set them on the antenna, looking down the, down the antenna and get the, uh, moon in the, uh, CCTV. Oh, that's an idea. Do a crosshair. They yeah. Don't do a crosshair. They just get in the center of the screen. What was the, uh, Denny, you showed one of those pictures that had a guy that had like a, like almost like a shock absorber thing, like a, uh, hydraulic. What? Oh, what that's a, that? that's a mechanically motor driven. It's a big, long bolt with a nut on it. And okay. that's tied to the outside, uh, the inside shaft. And as you, you motor makes it go up and down. It's the old screw, screwdriver antenna thing. It's the old C Sort of like a screwdriver antenna, yeah, but it's, yeah. it's off an old TVRO dish, a, a television. Yeah, the old C-band uh, C, C -band <coughs> dishes that you have in your backyard that are 10 feet in diameter. Use one of those. They're called jack screws. They're available for okay, from other things, but uh, the one I've got is off a TVRO dish. Okay, it's a DC so the, motor, so you can just flop the polarity and it goes up and down by flopping. Those are, those are nice and smooth too, aren't they? Yes, they are very smooth. They don't jerk the antenna around like my, my azimuth rotor does. They're 24 volt, 24 volt. Yes, they are, but 24 volt supplies now are cheap. Uh, the switching supplies out of China, you're only running a motor, you don't need a good supply. And uh, a lot of uh, industrial things are run off 24 volts. So 24 volt supplies are fairly easy to get. Oh, good. All right. Any more questions from anybody? Okay, Larry, uh, excuse me. Okay, Denny, thank you very much for the presentation. You're welcome. Great. I hope you got something out of it. I don't, I, yeah. I, I feel that some of the guys were at looking for more history and stuff. And I, I had a lot of slides to go through, so I kind of rushed it. No, that is, uh, you, you've taken all, some of the mystery out of it. It doesn't look nearly as, uh, undoable as it might sound you know the i've, I've seen some pictures in um you know in uh, magazines and these guys have these fancy fancy quad array you know things for for doing this and it looked like a kind of hobby you were going to have ten thousand dollars in it in a heartbeat you know and uh 
um, this this actually looks like it's something that that the average guy could pull off. So anyway, we really appreciate you wasting your Friday night on us, and uh, I hope uh, hope everybody enjoyed it. 